Hello and welcome to Life Science Genesis Biology Tutorials for all level students with me, your tutor, Mike Sikatema. So today we're going to talk about movement of substances in and out of the cell. So our objectives today, we're going to talk about uh, diffusion and osmosis. We have to be able to define diffusion and we have to be able to define osmosis. We have to explain the effects on the cell when placed in three types of solutions that we're going to talk about. A hypotonic solution, a hypertonic solution, and an isotonic solution. Relating these types of solutions to cells and osmosis. Then the last part which most students fail to understand mostly is the uh, process of active transport and its mechanisms and a few examples of active transport in and out of the cell in both plant cells and animal cells. So let's get to it. So what is diffusion? So normally when particles are placed in a concentration gradient, they tend to move from a region of high concentration to that of low concentration. For example, an aerosol like a perfume it would start off from one area of the room where it's mostly concentrated and the aroma of the perfume, the scent of the perfume can be, uh, can, uh, everyone in the room can sort of feel the presence of the perfume. So that uh, concentration difference where there is high concentration of a particle and a low concentration of the particle is known as a concentration gradient. Concentration gradient has to be reached. So particles will tend to move from a region of high concentration to that of low concentration until a state of equilibrium is reached. So that's the definition of diffusion. So what are some of the, uh, why is diffusion important in nature, you might ask? So let's start off from the lungs. So in the lungs, we have something known as the microcirculation. And in this microcirculation, the capillary bed is fenestrated, meaning it has very, very, very small pores or holes in between with a huge surface area. So uh, when we inhale oxygen, within the capillary bed of the alveoli, oxygen enters our lungs by the process of diffusion. And our red blood cells using hemoglobin are going to uh, release carbon dioxide out of our lungs to the atmosphere using diffusion. Another example is in photosynthesis in the stomata. Oxygen is necessary for photosynthesis as well as sunlight. So oxygen enters the plant cells via diffusion. Also, after the process of digestion in the small intestines in the villi, when amino uh, when proteins are broken down to amino acids and when complex carbohydrates are broken down to simple sh uh, super sugars like glucose, these enter the bloodstream to be utilized by the body to come to make ATP by diffusion. So I want you to notice that diffusion is a passive process. What do I mean when I say diffusion is a passive process? It means no energy is utilized. The process that's used is just down a concentration gradient from high to low concentration. No energy is utilized. Always remember that. And the net movement of particles will come to an end when an equilibrium balance is reached. So diffusion stops when the concentration gradient is zero, meaning there are equal uh, concentration of particles across that concentration gradient. Always remember that. So this picture just illustrates uh, a drop of ink being dropped in this beaker, as you can see molecules are going to slowly start diffusing out. And I want you to see that this is a concentration gradient between here where there is a low concentration of particles or no concentration and there. So that's low to high, that's what's called a concentration gradient. 
and particles will start to slowly move until equilibrium is reached. So the net movement of particles will be zero. So this just shows the structure of the alveoli that I explained. As you can see, these are red blood cells and that's the fenestrated capillary bed. Uh, what's happening is that air is coming in, carbon dioxide is going out. As air is coming in, these purplish red blood cells are becoming red, meaning they're becoming oxygenated. They are taking up oxygen using their hemoglobin molecules. And this happens by simple passive diffusion across the capillary bed. And here's an example of uh, glucose molecules entering the bloodstream in the capillary beds of the villi. So osmosis. So osmosis is the movement of water molecules across a partially permeable membrane or a selectively permeable membrane. So meaning osmosis has a rule that substances have to move from a region of high concentration to that of low concentration, or you can say water molecules are going to move from a region of high water potential to a region of lower water potential. Um, so there's, a, there's something I want you to understand where you can explain osmosis in a different way. And this is the way I try to understand what osmosis is. You have to understand the term osmolarity. So when there are osmotically active particles in a solution, osmotically active particles can be uh, glucose, it can be salt solutions or other electrolytes. Those osmotically active particles have a tendency to pull water. So water would like to move where there is a higher osmolarity, meaning where there is a lot of osmotically active particles that will pull the water. So here, highlighted in red, where I say concentrated solution has more osmotically active substances than, than love. <laughs> oh yeah, concentrated solution has more osmotically active substances that love to pull water towards them. This is a very, very important statement. So where there is a lot of, where there's a concentrated solution, there is more osmotically active particles that will have to pull the water towards them. So that's how water moves. Water follows osmotically active particles. So this is a very famous experiment and it's very highly examined. So I want you to analyze this. So there is a glass tube here and there is a sugar solution inside this biskin tube. So what will be the net movement of water? So I told you this sugar solution right here has what? It's an osmotically active particle. So glucose is osmotically active. So because the glucose molecules are, have a high osmolarity, they will have to pull water. So what's going to happen to the water? It's going to move from the beaker inside the solution up into the Viskin tube. So the water level in this uh, in this long glass cube is going to increase, while the water level in the beaker is going to reduce. So it's going to continue sucking water until it swells and turgid. So water enters the Viskin tube in by osmosis. Why? Because glucose solution has more osmotically active particles that have to draw the water in. The Viskin tube in will swell and become firm and uh, turgid. So let's analyze this experiment. So what's happening? The osmotically active particles are inside the beaker. So remember again, glucose has more osmotically active particles. So it's going to draw the water from this Viskin tube to the beaker. So water is going to move from the Viskin tube into the beaker. So 
the water level in this glass tube is going to reduce and the water level in the beaker is going to increase. So water leaves the Viking's tubing by osmosis. Why? Because the sugar mo um, molecules have got a higher osmolarity. They are, they are particles that love to pull water towards themselves. So the Viking tubing shrinks and becomes soft and flaccid. Understanding, right? Good. So what happens to a cell when placed in different types of solutions? So we're going to start off with an isotonic solution. So an isotonic solution is just a solution in which the concentration in and out of the cell is equal. So it has the same, it has the same tone or it has the same concentration as the cell. So as you can see, 20% solid concentration, 80% water, 20% solid concentration, 80% water. So nothing is going to happen to this cell because it's inside a solution. It's inside a solution, this is the, the tube, where the concentration in the inside of the cell, it's called the intracellular cellular environment, is equal to the extracellular environment. So let's look at B. What's happening to B? It seems water is moving out. So as you can see here, 40% solute concentration, meaning it has more osmotically active particles and it has got more water. And what's happening in the intracellular environment, 20% solute concentration, so it has less osmotically active particles and more water. So water is going to move from high concentration, 80%, to the beaker, which has 60% water. Or you can say there are more osmotically active particles in the 40% solute solution, so they're going to pull the water towards themselves, making the cell to, sh to shrink, to shrink. So this is called um, plasmolysis, the cell. So it's, it's sort of uh, shrunk, sort of shrunk. So let's look at what's happening to a cell that's put in a hypotonic solution. So you can see this is 10% solid concentration. It doesn't have a lot of osmotically active particles. But look at the intracellular environment. It has got a 20% solute concentration, meaning it has a lot of osmotically active particles that are going to suck in the water. So water is going to go into the cell and the cell is going to swell and it, it will burst, it will lies eventually as it gets more water. Or you can say, here there's 90% water, so it's going to move from a region of high concentration to that of low concentration. I don't across the selectively permeable membrane. That's your standard definition of osmosis, but I like to explain osmosis in terms of osmolarity, where you have more osmotically active particles that are pushing of water against them, uh, towards, towards themselves. So this is just the same experiment here, it's um, showing a red blood cell. So here it's been put in a hypotonic solution. So this hypotonic solution does not have a lot of osmotically active particles, meaning the intracellular environment will have more osmotically active particles and they'll suck the water right into the cell and it will eventually burst. So here, the red blood cell is normal because its intracellular environment has the same tonicity as the extracellular environment. So it's been placed in an isotonic solution and its membrane integrity is all right. So nothing is happening to the cell. This is a happy cell. So right here, this is a cell that's been placed in a hypertonic solution. Like I said, so the this is a very concentrated solution with osmotically active particles that are going to suck all the water out of the cell and it will eventually shrink. This is a very unhappy cell. So this is what happens. This is the same thing, uh, but we're explaining it in terms of plant cells. So what's happening here is the plant cell is in an isotonic solution. The intracellular 
environment is the same concentration as the extracellular environment. So the net movement of water in and out is at equilibrium, so nothing is happening. But as you can see here, part of the cytoplasm is being ripped out of the cell wall because water is moving out because it's been placed in a hypertonic solution, which is a very concentrated solution with more osmotically active particles that are sucking the water out. This cell has been placed in a hypotonic solution, so it has more osmotically active particles in its intracellular environment that are sucking the water uh, inside the cell. So because plant cells have a cell wall, the membrane integrity is going to be maintained, so the cell is going to be targeted. So what is active transport? So active transport is the opposite of um, passive diffusion, where we are moving substances from a region of high concentration to that of low concentration. How in this case scenario, we are moving solutions from a region of low concentration to that of high concentration against the concentration gradient. So how do we move something against the concentration gradient? What we're going to do is we're going to use ATP. So it will require energy. It's like a car going uphill against the pull of gravity. You have to hit the uh, accelerate button for you to give the engine enough power to move uphill. So I say active transport is the same as a car going uphill against the pull of gravity. You need that force to move. And that force in nature, when it comes to plant and animal cells, is known as ATP. So movement of substances against the concentration gradient using energy across a selectively permeable membrane. And uh, it's usually through transport proteins because remember the cell membrane is selectively permeable, but it still requires certain uh, substances and electrolytes that the cell needs and remember the net charge of the cell membrane is negatively charged so we need some transport proteins that can uh, open up and using ATP those molecules can move down the, uh, the concentration gradient using ATP so again the concentration gradient means low concentration to high concentration is the opposite of passive diffusion or osmosis so this diagram illustrates what's happening. So here, this is passive diffusion, no energy. Molecules are just moving down their concentration gradient. And look at this, this is a transport protein. So this process is known as facilitated diffusion because we are, we are using ATP. So sometimes active transport can be called facilitated, uh, oh no, no, sorry. Facilitated diffusion is something else, so forget about that. But here the molecules are moving from a region of low concentration to high concentration through a transport channel against the concentration gradient. So the concentration gradient is these solid molecules in high concentration, low concentration using ATP to open up this ion channel so that the molecules can move down the concentration against the concentration gradient. So what is the importance of active transport in nature? So as I said, some important molecules that cannot pass through the cell membrane. Remember, the cell membrane is negatively charged. Amino acids are negatively charged. Ions, some ions are negatively charged and negative charges repel. So we have to force those important substances, those important molecules to move against the concentration gradient using energy. Sugar molecules are usually too big to pass through the cell membrane. So we need active transport to sort of squeeze them through the cell membrane using energy inside this, uh, the cell using active transport. So here's an example of a root hair cell moving minerals across its cell membrane. Remember, this uh, uh, cell wall is selectively permeable and these minerals are 
negatively charged, some of them are negatively charged, but they are important, they are needed by the cell. So what's going to happen is that using ATP across these ion channels, we're going to use osmosis to force these molecules in low concentration inside the cell. So active transport uses energy from respiration. Energy from respiration is ATP to move substances against the concentration gradient. So I just explained these specific minerals from the soil enter through the channels in the cell walls, the root hair cell. The minerals then travel around the plant in the exylem vessels. Here we're going to talk about um, transport in flowering plants in a future video where we're going to talk about the uh, as plants and other types of uh, transport systems. All right, so I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you've understood the difference between diffusion and osmosis and some experiments using the Vikings tubing. If you like this video, give us a like, give us a thumbs up, give us a share. And if you have any question, you can email me or you can call me. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.